I'm Paul Kimball, and welcome to Visionaries, the series that documents the stories of individual Canadians of faith and their profound impact on our country's history. In this episode, we'll be examining the life and times of Henry Allen, Canada's first great evangelist, who in the 1770s began his career here in the Annapolis Valley of Nova Scotia, where his influence is still felt today. It was here that a group of New England settlers, including the Allen family, settled in the autumn of 1760 on lands taken from the recently deported Acadians. These New England planters, as they were called, brought with them a deep sense of Christian belief and looked forward to spreading the gospel in this remote part of the New World. There was only one problem with their desire to preach the gospel throughout Nova Scotia. The isolation and the primitive living conditions of the new settlements were a less than attractive proposition to their regular New England ministers. Falmouth was a long way from Boston. When his family settled in Falmouth, there would be no permanent clergy, no schools, uh, and very, very few indications of even a permanent settlement in that region. So Henry Allen is, is really leaving behind many of the, the attributes of New England society. Uh, really leaving behind so much of what was familiar to him. Allen, like most young people in Nova Scotia at the time, participated in what they called frolics, social gatherings marked by dancing and music and drinking. While these served to relieve the tedium and sense of isolation of colonial life, Allen's participation in them weighed heavily on his conscience. It was an inner conflict he recorded on a daily basis in his personal journal. The devil and my own wicked heart with the solicitations of my associates and my fondness for young company were such strong allurements I would again give way, and thus I got to be very wild and rude. But when I returned from my carnal mirth, I felt as guilty as ever, and could sometimes not close my eyes for some hours after I had got home on account of the guilt I had contracted the evening before. These feelings of profound Christian guilt combined in Allen's mind with another crucial element. In walks here, in the fields and in the woods near his home, he was overcome with an almost incapacitating sense of his own mortality and a very real fear of death. I was even afraid of trees falling on me when I was in the woods and in time of thunder would expect that the next flash of lightning would be commissioned to cut me off. Thus, I was one of the unhappiest creatures that lived on earth. Alan was torn by the contradictions between his belief in a God of love and forgiveness, who offered the opportunity for salvation to everyone who would accept Christ as their personal savior, and what he saw as the harsh and unforgiving God preached by the puritanical clergy of the Congregationalist Church that he had grown up in. To Alan, this was a God that predetermined some to be saved, while everyone else was damned. I was led to think of God as bad as the devil by that blasphemous doctrine, that God foreordained whatsoever comes to pass, and consequently the death and damnation of the greatest part of the world, and yet made them an offer of salvation where there is none for them. Why will they dress up such a loving, good, and glorious being in such a black and ridiculous habit? Why do they not let God speak for himself? When you read Henry Allen's journal, it's interesting to see that it takes him about 60 pages to come to this experience. All of life is building to that point. One of the differences that is there between later evangelicalism is that out of the Puritan tradition, there's that feeling that it'll take a long while to get converted, and it doesn't come easy. It's with a lot of agony. Allen's feelings of Christian guilt, his fear of dying, and his disenchantment with traditional Calvinist teachings continued to haunt him until 1775, when here, near his home in Falmouth, he underwent a powerful spiritual regeneration. It was an extraordinary experience that he later recounted in vivid detail in his own personal journal. Oh, help me, help me, I cried, thou redeemer of souls, 
and save me or I am gone forever. At that instant, when I gave up all to him, redeeming love broke into my soul. The burden of guilt and condemnation was gone, darkness was expelled, and my will turned of choice after the infinite God. I was now filled with immortal love, soaring on the wings of faith. I was ravished with a divine ecstasy beyond any doubts or fears. Alan became convinced that he had been called to preach the gospel. He was certain that if he could relate his own personal experience to people, they would accept the free grace that he believed God had offered to everyone. To Alan, it was an urgent matter of life and death, not just in this world, but in the one to come. Oh, that the world were awake to know their standing and embrace redeeming love! But ah, uh, how little, how little do they know of themselves? How little do they consider that they are prisoners of hope, inhabitants of a moment and bound for eternity? self-condemned, yet surrounded with free and unbounded grace. But because they knew not the worth and danger of their own souls, nor the worth of a Redeemer's love, they waste their days unconcerned and post down to eternal perdition. Allen determined to travel to New England to study theology. The American Revolution, however, permanently altered his destiny. Travel to New England was no longer possible. At the same time, the governor of Nova Scotia called up the colonial militia. Allen, as a young man fit for duty, was requested to put in for a commission as an officer. For him, the choice was clear. He could either fight for king and country, or he could begin his fight for the king of heaven. I utterly refused. Take away all honor but the glory of the cross and all commissions but a commission from heaven to go forth and enlist my fellow mortals to fight under the banners of King Jesus. He rejects his, the offer of a commission in the militia, rejects, in fact, that kind of worldly leadership. He is determined now to devote his life to leading people to Christ. This gives, of course, his own life a very different orientation, and says a great deal about his rejection of um, secular authority, rejection of allegiance to either Great Britain or to New England. Allen began to preach in the area around his home, and interest spread quickly. He was soon called upon to preach in other communities throughout the Annapolis Valley. As he traveled beyond Falmouth, however, he encountered opposition in almost every settlement he entered, particularly from those with established churches and ordained Calvinist ministers. One of those who really reacted negatively to Henry Allen was the Reverend Jonathan Scott in Yarmouth. And as he reacted to him, he disliked his methods, he disliked his message, and he saw him as a common ravager of the churches. And he let his views be known. He even wrote against him. And in the midst of that period of time, the controversy between these two became pretty well known. The members of my congregation flocked to hear him, thereby giving force to his numerous doctrines of devils and seducing spirits. He breaks into churches and creeps into houses. He is subversive of all order, both divine and human, and spreads desolation and disorder wherever he goes. Allen and his followers also faced determined opposition from the colonial establishment in Halifax particularly from the Church of England. The times call for diligence and exertion in the clergy to prevent their flocks from being led astray by ignorant and mistaken zealots. Enthusiasm, when applied to religion, signifies a vain belief in private revelations from the deity. Their errors are not the less pernicious, either to the souls of individuals or to society. We must therefore guard against them with earnestness and Christian temper. Bishop Charles Inglis. Allen thrived on the opposition and deftly turned it to his own advantage. He painted his critics as reactionaries and himself as a spiritual revolutionary. What right have you to preach the gospel, sir? Where are your credentials? My authority is from heaven and heaven alone. As for credentials, I have a license from the congregation in Horton. From the congregation? Without a license from a society of ministers, sir, you have no right to preach. 
You threatened to break all order and tradition. Is that really what you want? Sir, you talk of tradition and order. I say that the spirit of God is far more important than the bare traditions of men. You, sir, are a stiff young man. Alan plays a significant role in the development of a number of churches and the establishment of, of new church bodies in the Maritimes. And he does this really on the basis of the will of the, of the populace, the, the people that he has stirred, that he has gathered together. And this is a, a different concept of church founding. They want me to acknowledge that I have done wrong, preaching without a license from the ministers. I believe that the church itself holds that prerogative, and I shall use what influence I have to my dying day to restore that power which the ministers have robbed from the church. And so Alan's followers will feel that once they have gathered together in a body, they are a church does not need the blessing of uh, an association, of uh, a larger body, uh, some hierarchy, to establish them as a, as a separate church, a separate denomination. Allen was successful because he preached his message with an unmatched charismatic enthusiasm that swept his listeners up in the ecstasy of the moment. He was a prolific hymn writer, and he used these songs in combination with his own sermons and with active lay participation in the service to bring his congregations together in a shared communion of souls. Forever in the realms above, bound up in everlasting love, I shall with joy and wonder see that Christ who gave his life for me. Oh, the unhappiness of this day by reason of darkness until the evening when preaching the gospel, the Lord gave me great liberty from my chains and sent a blessing by me to many of his children. Oh, the sweet moments and happy days that I have seen in the house of God among the Christians. It is a happiness that the world knows nothing of. Break sacred morn with beams of light, and from my soul expel the night, and sweetly steal my heart away with raptures of immortal day. He establishes the expectation of religious leaders who will uh, excite, will ex stimulate, will stir the people. Um, they are, many of them will not be very content in years to come uh, with ministers who will merely read sermons from the pulpit uh, on Sunday morning. So the, the style of religion in the Maritimes, of evangelical religion in the Maritimes, will certainly be very, very different because of what Henry Allen has done.